and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Yes, uh, here we go again. Matthew chapter 24, the words of Yeshua, which says, Such things must happen, but the end is, is not yet come. So if you're looking today at the news and you're seeing once again the uh, what looks like prophecy being fulfilled, well, it's going to continue. And um, in, in my opinion, I mean, I, I don't ever want to see the death of, uh, of innocent people, but ladies and gentlemen, this is what's going to happen as we come closer to the days of his kingdom. Um, there's so much happening regarding Ukraine, and there's many prophecy teachers out there that are teaching a number of things that are very good about the, uh, the importance of Ukraine and all of these things. There's also some statements that uh, Hanok Young and I uh, were discussing. We may talk about a little bit more on this week's Israel update of the, the words of the Vilna Gahon, and uh, an amazing man who was uh, very, uh, spoke very much prophetically into the days that we are living in right now. Now, on another note, um, probably most of you have seen the news that right out of the blue, I mean, I wasn't expecting it. I don't know anyone that was, but Israel has decided that March 1st, they're going to open the borders to everyone. Uh, you've got to have a PCR test, I guess, before you go in, PCR test before you come back out. And um, so with that being said, the Connect to Israel tour uh, that we have scheduled for uh, November of 2022 is moving forward. We've, uh, we haven't said a lot about it lately, but at this point in time, it appears that we have, uh, by the time I receive the registrations that I believe are coming in, we have uh, about 15 to 18 people that are already uh, in the process of signing up for that tour. And so we do cut that off at 25. Uh, I'm not going to take, maybe you know, 26, 27, but it's, it doesn't go much over that because we're not going to turn a tour into a three ring circus. So if you're interested in going to Israel with Hanok and I for the Connect Israel tour, and let me, if, uh, if I have to say this again, I guess I will. This is not your standard uh, see the holy sites tour, all right? We're gonna go see a lot of things, but this is about connecting with the Elohim, the God of Israel, the land of Israel, and last but certainly not least, the people of Israel. You're going to be uh, in the homes of Israelis. You're going to be face-to-face uh, -face with people that have, uh, have been a part of the establishment of Israel, hearing the stories, and at the same time, seeing the amazing places of Israel. So if you're interested, go to uh, connecttoisrael.org and you can get the information there. If you need any other information, please let me know. Just send me an email, uh, uh, and, you know, email, text, give me a call, carrier pigeon, whatever you want to do. Uh, that's totally up to you. So we go into this week's Torah portion of, uh, we're coming toward the end, toward the end of the book of Shemot and this amazing account of the tabernacle, the Mishkan, the tent for the dwelling of yud heh -Vav -Heh in their midst. And it begins by with uh, saying, Moshe assembled the whole community of Israel and said to them, these are the things that yud heh -Vav -Heh has ordered you to do. Uh, the word there is kahal, which uh, for many of you know that uh, Kathy and myself, we began a congregation uh, the end of, uh, about the end of July of this past year. And uh, the, the word, it's called life assembly or kahal kaim. And the word kahal is one that I've used in the past. I believe it's a, a very significant word. Uh, we do not, uh, I do not refer to our congregation as a church. 
Uh, I do not refer to our congregation as a, an ecclesia, but I want to go back to the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew context of what these words are, because they carry such amazing uh, meaning. Now, the word kahal is used three times in the, uh, in the, the book of Exodus. In fact, we'll see the, the first time that is used is uh, in last week's Torah portion, and then here in, uh, in this week's Torah portion, as the, um, it says that he assembled, okay, the, the word kahal, and that word is, uh, it's a, a kuf, a hey, and a lamed. Uh, let's make sure of that kuf, yes, <laughs> I had to, I, I'm actually trying to figure out the spelling of it right now, because um, when it goes from English to Hebrew, uh, there's, there's some very small nuances there that get very confusing to me and to a number of other people that I know. So uh, this, this word is about the rising sun. So it's about a, a place of darkness, and we're all familiar, I hope, with the rising of the sun. If you've ever been uh, hiking and you you've stay or camping and you've you've uh, you've stayed out in the woods and you know how dark it can be and you start to look for the rays of the rising sun and when you see that light on the horizon it's just a um, it, it's it's more than just the, uh, the the being able to see is this comforting feeling this warmth that's going to be coming uh, from the chill of the evening. So it's about the rising of the sun. The hay, of course, is the breath and the lamed. So kof hay lamed, which is the letter of the king and looks like a shepherd's staff. So it is about the, the light rising upon those who are uh, being assembled, called to his breath, to his authority, which, of course, is the word, the breath and authority of the king of the shepherd. So if someone asks you, uh, you know, about your congregation, you can explain to them, this is who I want to be hanging out with. I want to be hanging out with people that are receiving the light, that are walking toward and, and are gathering in the, the breath and authority of the king around the protection of the shepherd's staff. Uh, the other place that this, ver that this word is used, actually, though, is back over in chapter uh, 32, when they, the people gathered around Aaron. Oh, yeah. So we have a choice today of who we're going to gather with, the doctrine of those that we're going to gather around, and the leader that we're going to gather with. Let's kind of consider this, and I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not going back and pointing the fingers at Aaron, but uh, Aaron is the one that came up with the golden calf, is he not? He's the one that, you know, strip off the, the, the earrings and all that kind of stuff and let, poof, a calf comes out uh, and, and took the people into a place of death. Whereas Moshe is taking the, the people to a place of life. We have a choice today whether to gather with those that are bringing us into death or bringing us into life. So this word, actually, let's go back over to Matthew chapter 24. Before the wars and rumors of wars, the disciples are gathered on the Mount of Olives, and they look at Yeshua and, says, and say to him, uh, what, tell us, what will these things, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, he didn't start with wars and rumors of wars and famines and you know, all of these things happen. What does he start with? He starts with these words. Watch out. Don't let anyone fool you or deceive you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah, 
and will lead many astray, or could we say lead many unto death? See, Aaron was leading the people to a false image, you know, pun intended, a false image of yud heh And that false image, it says that he asah, he, he was trying to bring life into that image. We have to be careful that what we're, what we're trying to bring life into can bring life into us. A false idol of a false kahal will bring forth a false messiah and will in the end bring forth death. Whereas when we bring life, our life, into his life, we end up receiving his life. So do not let anyone deceive you. And I believe that this is something that should be spoken from the rooftops today because so many people are being deceived by everything that comes out on social media, on YouTube, or on you know this tube, that tube, the other tube, the, the, the false prophets, the someone speaks a word, and it becomes viral, but it has no life in the end. Be careful. Let, to, to use the words of Yeshua himself, let no man deceive you. And the way that we can, uh, the, the way that we can guard against deception is to gather ourselves and I know that we have, I have listeners that are all over the world, literally. And many of you, you, you have no other, uh, there, there's no one else around you. But what are you doing? Uh, in, in right here, you're gathering. You're gathering with people that are not, me specifically, I pray that I never lead anyone into a false idol. So gather with people that you see are bringing forth the truth. If you have the ability to be around a congregation, as the, the words of Hebrew says, forsake not the gathering of yourselves. Now, I know that those words are, I believe those words are speaking specifically of the feasts, the festivals, but also of Shabbat. Forsake not the gathering of yourselves. And look at these words. It's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, I believe. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. As we see wars, rumors of wars, famine, inflation, all of these things that are happening around us today. What should it cause us to do? It should cause us to hunger and thirst more for the gathering of people who are seeking the life that can bring forth life into our own, in, into ourselves. Now, he says, uh, going back into the Torah portion, that the next thing he brings up, of course, is Shabbat. Once again, in the midst of building of the tabernacle, how many times is the theme Shabbat, 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 Shabbat? Do, do, do you think? that maybe he's trying to give us a message that even in the work that we're doing, Shabbat is the focus, that all that we do in the six days is to prepare us for the seventh. And then what we do on the seventh is, just is to prepare us for the other six. Now, we, we have another twist here that David Stern brings out uh, in his translation of this is a day to honor the Shabbat is not just about guarding it for the sake of guarding it, but guarding the Shabbat is a way that we can honor the Almighty because He has given us this day. It is a gift unto us and us walking in it 
it is, it's kind of like giving your children. Remember, uh, you know, with uh, it, it, those of you that have raised children or in the process of doing so, you give your child a gift. They're excited for a couple of minutes over that gift, but the next day they don't want to have anything to do with it. They got bored with it. Mm. How many people are there that, well, you know, I, I know that, and I know he's given a Shabbat and, and it's this wonderful gift, but I'm bored with it. I want something more. I want to do something else. That's not honoring. To see a child take a toy that you gave them and six months later, they're still playing with the toy. Uh, what is that? That's honoring. That's honoring unto you. Let's not get bored with the gifts that he's giving us. Now, it goes on and says, let the, um, uh, do, 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 where, which verse am I at here? Uh, yeah, we have, uh, there he is. Here is what he has ordered. Take up a collection for yud heh vav -Hey from among yourselves. Now, the question is this. Is this still the first collection? Uh, when we go back to Exodus chapter 25, and he says, you're to take up a collection for everyone who wholeheartedly wants to give. Was that collection ever actually received? Or was it a precursor to an, this event here? Or was that received and then we have the offering of the golden calf and now we have another offering? I tend to believe that this is a, a reference to the words of the first offering, Exodus chapter 25, when it was a preparatory verse, prepare yourself for what we are going to be doing. And so in the midst of that, there became this counterfeit collection. See, if, if I'm right in this, Exodus chapter 25 that offering was never received. So when Aaron comes to the people, what's he saying? Oh, it's time for the offering that Moshe spoke of, an offering that no one should have given to. But yet, now that we're past the golden calf instance, he says, he reiterates, take up a collection from those who wholeheartedly want to give. And that sets up this sentence. <laughs> now it's in our scripture, it's chapter 35 verses 10 through 19. But if you will look at this in English, a, a friend of mine uh, used to uh, do my editing when I was writing a, a Torah commentary. I no longer do that because I found that uh, there's very few people that, today that read. <laughs> okay? I mean, not that can't, that can read or can't read, but there's very few that read. So I have to look at my time and try to put the most effort into what is bringing forth the most fruit. And that was not the writing of a Torah commentary. So uh, they used to always get after me that I would do run on sentences. Well, you know, uh, I got this crazy thing in life that I write as I talk, uh, which may not be the best English, but it's the way that I do it, okay? Okay. And so he would always get after me. And when I, re I actually wrote a com commentary years ago about this one sentence and this run on sentence, which is chapter 35, verses 10 through 19. And it is the summary of the Mishkan. It's the summary of the Mishkan, not only of the tent pegs and the curtains and this element and that element, the other element, but also the priest... Aaron and his sons, the garments that they were wearing became a part of the tabernacle. So the tabernacle uh, as a building was beautiful. It was elegant. It was expensive. But it had no real meaning until two things happened. Two things. Number one is the people took ownership of 
the purpose of the tabernacle, and then what we will read in next week's Torah portion, the Shekinah, the glory of yud heh vav enters into the tabernacle. So it is a place, it becomes a place, once again, for the heavenly realm of the Shekinah, the earthly realm of the presence of mankind, to come together in a tent, in a dwelling place, for the purpose of worship, for the purpose of revelation, of who yud heh vav is, literally it is the earthly realm revelation to others of the spiritual realm yud heh vav Do I really need to go into that? I, I don't think so. If you don't see the similarities, not of a, let me, let me phrase it very uh, specific, not of a church building. Uh, but of a kahal, a building. When we meet on Shabbat, uh, we have a building that we rent. But when we, when we walk out the door, it's just a building. It's just bricks, glass, drywall, paint, a kitchen sink, a bathroom, there's nothing there. It's an inanimate object. But when we walk into that building on Shabbat, when the kahal, those that are called to his staff, to his breath, to his authority, when we enter in and then he graces us with his presence in that building, it now has life. It now has revelation to others that would enter in. Now, Kaya, somebody's just came in and Kaya's barking at him because that's what Kaya does. All right. Now, moving on, uh, the whole community withdrew from the presence of Moshe to go and get, figure out what they were going to give, uh, bring that, take that, bring that to Moshe so that he could use that in the building of the tabernacle. One of my favorite parts of teaching on the Mishkan, the tabernacle is this, that at the time of the Hebrews, I mean, take yourself back to the day, all right? At the time of the Hebrews in the wilderness, they brought this offering. This offering is then used by Be'ezel and Ohaliav, and it is the, the tabernacle comes forth before them. Imagine, and those of you that have been at that teaching, and by the way, I'll be in Seneca, South Carolina on May or on March 12th doing this teaching, if you're anywhere in the area. Um, let me know and I'll be glad to send you some information. But imagine, if you would, being a part of that time, of that people. And the, the tabernacle is all put together. The tabernacle has, is, is, is in its, uh, it's being used for its purpose. The Shekinah is, is upon it. And you take your family out for an evening walk and you're, you're walking around and, and all of a sudden you notice this piece of, of, of porpoise skin or a, a piece of, uh, of linen or, or some material and you know, you've got your children with you. And you stop and you, you're able to point to that and say, you know, look, this is, this is the piece that we gave. This is what we gave to the building of the tabernacle. What wonder... I mean, that to me is, is just beyond really comprehension to be able to understand. And, and maybe that's the, the hardest thing today for, for many people to understand is that when we give of our time, when we give of our resources, uh, when we give of our finances, okay, you, you can't, it's, you know, go back and look at the words. It's all together there. 
Um, when we give of what we have been given, it is taking part. And here's the problem that I've, I was a part of, of churches, and I'm, I'm sure that many of you have been, that it was the, the latest building program. Uh, I got tired of the latest building programs giving over and over and over again to them while looking around and seeing that the building that we have is not filled up to begin with and is not being used for its fullness. It's being used, you know, just a couple of times a week. Uh, why do we need another program? Well, another program gets you excited about something that's maybe needed or not, okay? And so we've, we've all been there. But today we live in a day. We live in a time in which we're watching, as it were, the, the, the message I just did this month, the footsteps of Mashiach. I believe we're watching these these times, and today we have the opportunity to be a part, uh, wh whether it be a, a tour to Israel or, you know, maybe, let me just, let me issue a, 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 um, a bit of a challenge right now, okay? Now, those of you that watch this video, that listen on various formats, um, you... Your generosity is, uh, for many of you, is out, is amazing to me. Uh, the words thank you, it just is, they just, I can use Hebrew, todaraba, it still doesn't mean anything, okay? Uh, there's, there's, the vast majority though, the vast majority never give anything. And, and if you, you were in the day of Moshe, after that tabernacle, you'd been like, you know, walking around with this family and, and you know, they're, they're pointing to something that you gave and part of it. And, um, you know, you're here going, <laughs> you know, your kids are saying, well, mom, dad, what part did we give? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, we just used everything for our, on ourselves. Okay. Um, I, I'm not getting into this, that part of it, but I got a challenge for you. The, the only way that this is slightly a commercial message. The only way that Joy to Hashem, the ministry that, uh, that we've had now for oh, 19 years exists is because of you, because of your generosity. The way that I'm able to do these, this broadcast, the other broadcasts that I do, the traveling that I do, um, you know, the, the tours, all that kind of stuff. It's all because of your generosity. Thank you. Uh, the giving that we do to Israel is because of you. Thank you. Let me give you another challenge right now. I know of numerous people that desire to go to Israel in November with us that cannot afford it. They, they can't. I'm going to ask you to do something. You, you'll never know who it is. You'll never know, you know, anything about because that's not what it's about, okay? Remember, Yeshua talked about the right-hand, left-hand thing? But I need some people to step up to the plate, as it were, and to give so that we can help some people. Maybe you cannot go to Israel because of age, health, whatever, whatever it is. But you can seed. This is what birthright Israel, the essence of birthright Israel, which is basically an organization, Jewish organization, that any Jewish young person, I can't remember the, 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 um, uh, the, the ages, every Jewish young person can go to Israel with, with all their expenses paid, they have to have their own, I guess, spending money. But the, the, the original intent was for these young people to see what Israel is. You wonder about the fruit of that? Hanok Young, as I'm recording, 
is back in, uh, about to get on a plane tomorrow night to go back to Israel. The original seed for him was birthright tour. A, I don't know if it was birthright at that time, but it was something similar to it. You don't know what you're planting a seed in. So I'm asking you, I'm asking you if you can do so to write a check, put on there, uh, you know, to help someone to go to Israel. And whatever funds come in, I will, I will do the best I can to make that as fruitful as I can. I will make sure to the best of my ability that your seed bears fruit. The other side of this is, is this, I'm making this long, is in November we'll be taking funds to Israel. I may be going early. I may be going uh, sometime, uh, I'm not sure exactly when yet. But once again, we should all have, we should all have as part of our giving to I something to Israel. Go back and read Romans chapter 15 if you don't believe me. All right, let me move on. I spent way too much time there, but I think it was important. Uh, that which Be'ezel and Oholiav are given is the, in verse 31, he was filled with, filled him with the spirit of Elohim, with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Uh, you can look at these verses on your own. Later on, it's Proverbs chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. Uh, also reference over to Jeremiah chapter 10. And this is the same, uh, the, the same elements, if you would, that were used in the creation of the world. Proverbs chapter, um, once again, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 19 through 20, the same elements of the Father that were used to create the world itself is placed into Be'edzel, Ohaliav, in order for them to create the tabernacle for the Almighty to dwell in which goes back to Genesis chapter 1. Why did he create? In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Why? A place that he may dwell with his people, which is the same thing as the tabernacle, which is, by the way, the same thing as this, this dirt suit that we have is a place for him to dwell with us. All right. Uh, let's, let's move on here into... I want to hit just a couple more verses. Um, in, in chapter 36, verse 20, we see the, the planks of acacia wood. Each plank was 15 feet long, two and a quarter feet wide. There were two projections on each plank, and the planks were joined to one another. So as you would look at this plank, it, it, it's... It's, it's just a, a rectangular, it's a board, okay, of acacia wood that is overlaid with gold. And then there's these two projections at the base of it. And the projections, if you consider it, it's kind of like a, a man standing and with, with two feet. And these two feet are placed into the foundation of the tabernacle and it says that they are joined to one another or that life is brought into them. So the tabernacle is to teach us about, a, about life. It's, it's the opposite of the golden calf. The golden calf, back to that, the golden calf can never be a reference to the Messiah. This is why when we take the feasts, the festivals that are in the scripture, Leviticus chapter 23, various other places, and they are replaced by, it doesn't matter if they have pagan origin or not. Okay, you can come up with, today as I'm recording is Tuesday. It's all over the internet. Okay, February 2, 22nd, 2-2. Two, two, um, year 2022 two, two, so two, 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 and it's Tuesday yeah ha ha okay uh, all kinds of references to the numerology of this specific week but you can take you can make a holiday out of Tuesday 
two, 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 and it cannot bring life because it's not associated with the scriptural basis. So when we take holidays that came from other origins, I'm not saying pagan, I'm just saying other origins, okay? We take those holidays and then place them into the scripture. What have we done? We've come up with a golden calf that cannot point us to the Messiah. The planks, the tabernacle itself, is all a picture of the Messiah and can bring forth, Asa can bring forth life. In uh, verse 35, it talks about, he made the curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, finely woven linen, all right, going on down in verse 37, the entrance to the tent is to be is to be a screen of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, finely woven linen, and it's to be held up with five posts. Here's, here's the picture, folks. Five posts, the Torah. We see in the going into the Kodesh Kodeshim, the Holy of Holies, we see four posts, which is the gospel. So when we tie the five posts of the Torah with the four posts of the gospel, both of them are referencing Messiah. We see the colors of blue. The book of John speaks of the one who would come from the heavens. Purple, the royalty, which is the book of Matthew. Scarlet, the book of Luke, that speaks more about the blood, the resurrection. Uh, in the scarlet, the redeemer, and the, the linen, which is white, which is the, the purity that's brought forth in the book of Mark. So what do we see? The, the five books would be the entrance of Revelation to the four books. I guess I could do it like that. The Torah is the foundational revelation to the Gospels, which lead us to the message of Yeshua, the perfect man, who came from the heavens, is our king and our redeemer. Well, that's life. That's a message of life, which is a lot more of a message than a golden calf. All right. Now, moving on. We then go to um, the the menorah. I want to go spend a little bit of time here at the menorah and bring out something that I spoke on last Shabbat at our congregation. Uh, this is not something that I got out of a book or commentary, but I was looking at the scriptures, reading through, studying, praying uh, on Shabbat morning, and all of a sudden dawned on me. So I started to run with this, and I haven't quite completed this, uh, this message yet. But when we talk about the menorah, the, of course, the, the base foundation of the menorah is Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, that's where the, the, seven, the seven words of Hebrew form a menorah. Dr. Alyssa Allwine has, has spoken on this extensively. Uh, but then we go over to Isaiah chapter 11. And what we, what we have is a branch will emerge from the tr trunk of Jesse. A shoot will grow forth from his roots. The spirit of yud heh will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, power, knowledge, and fearing yud heh I've done a, a lot of teaching, not as much as Alyssa, but uh, I've done a lot of teaching on the menorah. I, I love this, this article that's in the tabernacle. Um, here's here's a, something that... Until this past Shabbat, I'd never taught on, I'd never seen this. We understand that we serve the Creator. Now, I'm kind of a stickler on this, that when I look out the window, I don't see nature. I see creation. Okay, Because I want to see creation, which is linked to the Creator, not nature, which is linked to a mother, mother nature, Okay, which is a counterfeit. We serve the creator. The world serves, the world system serves 
one who fell, uh, we would call him Satan, Hasatan, whatever you want to term, and has come up with a system which refers to as the Babylonian system, the Egyptian system, the world system, whatever you want to put in there to describe this to you, or describe it for you better. Hasatan cannot create anything. All he can do is pervert. So he takes creation and makes it nature. Taking the emphasis off the creator and to Mama Earth, okay? I, that may stun some of you, but it, this, this is the way that I see things. Not, as, not telling you you have to see it. This is the way I see things because I want, even in my looking out the window, I want it to be referencing the one that I serve as the creator. With that being said, if there is a menorah, which is revealed to us in Isaiah chapter 11, then there would be a fake menorah that would be the satanic menorah. So what would we see? If a branch will emerge from the trunk of Jesse, referencing the lineage of the Messiah, then there will be a branch that emerges from the from Satan himself, from the fallen angels, and from rebellion. What would this menorah look like? The seven, what's called the seven spirits of Yah, would then be mirrored in the world as the seven spirits of Hasatan. So first of all, instead of having a branch that will come forth and be the shamash, instead of being the servant, the word shamash in Hebrew is servant, we would see him as a controller. That'll come out a little bit more. The spirit of Yudhe would now become the spirit of the world. The spirit of wisdom, and you might want to write this down or go back over this, and, and I, as I said, I'm just now, this is very fresh uh, in what I'm trying to teach right here, so I'm kind of working through it a little bit. The spirit of wisdom would be the spirit of cunning and deception. The spirit of understanding would be the spirit of evolution. We understand, the scripture says, we understand that the worlds came into being. Okay, go back and look at the references there. I didn't write it down. The world came into being through the breath of Yudhe Vavhe, but the worldly wisdom, or excuse me, the worldly understanding is that we came forth through evolution. The spirit of counsel. The spirit of self-help. That I don't need a Messiah. I don't, I don't need forgiveness. I don't need redemption. I can just go to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, who can tell me to pull myself up by my bootstraps and, uh, and move on. And, and I can just read this book and that book and the other book. And, and, and I can help myself along the way. It's the, it's the same thing as the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. That I can help myself. I can command God. Uh, how does that work out? I said on Shabbat that I, I, I it's beside me. And I, I don't want to be judgmental here in what I'm about to say. But just consider it. it it's just beyond my imagination of, of how a person can go to a secular psychiatrist and expect to get anywhere. How do, you have, how do you find help from someone who doesn't know where help comes from? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me. But it's just me. The spirit of counsel is the spirit of self-help. The spirit of power is the spirit of control. Wow, you look at the last two years that we've lived through. Uh, 
you know, call it plandemic, pandemic, whatever you want to call it, you know, is it from a bat cave or Robin's cave or um, Wuhan or this wet market or where, what, it doesn't matter. Let me tell you what the last two years have been about is control. Very simple, straightforward. These last two years have been about control and pushing the envelope. I'm not talking about politics right here. I'm not talking about masks or shots or whatever. It's about control. It's pushing the envelope of seeing who will submit to control. The spirit of knowledge. Science. Do we want to follow his knowledge? Which says I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And the, the, the knowledge of of, of, uh, of, of nutrients that can, can aid in our, our system and, and helping us, or so-called science. I have a hard time following someone that believes that we came from monkeys. In fact, if you follow someone that believes you came from monkeys, they'll make a monkey out of you. I have a hard time following a so-called scientist that says that, it was a big bang that, you know, it just all of a sudden happened. I, I just, you know, when, when the root of someone is a lie, don't expect the end result, the fruit to be, when the root is a lie, the end result will be a lie. And it will be about control and all these, and then fear. What is the, the spirit of fear is that I am reverencing the one who declared the end out of the beginning. Not, not from the beginning, the end out of the beginning. That I have a reverence. I have a, yes, fear. I, have a, I am awestruck at the one who declared the end out of the beginning. The other side of that, the satanic menorah would be the unknown. Fear of the unknown. I desire to fear and reverence the one who is known, not the unknown, which is where anxiety, all kinds of things come from. Lastly, the menorah, or excuse me, the, uh, the, the laver. The laver was made from the mirrors of the women. In the book of Yaakov, or James, chapter 1, verse 22, Don't deceive yourselves by only hearing what the word says, but do it. For whoever hears the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at their face in a mirror, who looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what he looks like. But a person who looks closely into the perfect Torah, which gives freedom to Continue and continues becoming not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work it requires, then he will be blessed in what he does. Now these are not just words that Yaakov came up with. This, this thing of, of looking into the mirror of the Torah was a rabbinic teaching of the day that, that Yaakov had heard. A teaching that's still today, that someone who looks into the word but fails to see themselves and do something about it, but just walks away and does nothing. That's called a believer. I don't want to be a believer because the book of Yaakov will continue on and say, the demons believe and they tremble. I want to be a doer of the word. Shavuot Shabbat Shalom. Have a blessed, prosperous week. And... Um, Bezrat Hashem, God willing, see you again next week. If you, if you want to get involved in Israel with the tour or you can't, please consider donating to help those that can. Um, it would be very much appreciated, not just by me, but I believe that uh, there would be blessings that would come. Be strong. Yivarechach Adonai V'yishmarecha
יאר אדוני פניו אליך וייחונך. יישא אדוני פניו אליך ויישם לך שלום